The interview you're about to see is with the pianist Ruth McGinley, originally from Derry in Northern Ireland. She gained widespread recognition as one of Ireland's leading pianists when she won the piano final of the BBC Young Musician of the Year competition in 1994. Since then, she's performed all over Europe and the Middle East as a soloist with various orchestras and broadcasts on radio regularly. She now lives back in Northern Ireland and combines her performing career with teaching and mentoring young musicians. She's an incredibly open, warm woman with an amazing personal story. And I really appreciated her openness in this interview, talking about mental health, anxiety, and lots of things that affect all of us, but aren't often talked about um, in detail. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Ruth. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Where, whereabouts are you at the moment? Well, I am in sunny. Well, not so sunny today, but it has been sunny Belfast. Um, I'm here in, well, pretty much still in lockdown, although restrictions have been lifted a little bit, but I'm, I'm still pretty much at home um, with my son, with my 20-year-old son, Michael. Oh, lovely. And it- which, which could be <laughs> an absolute you know recipe for disaster but it's it's been really good and good for both of us um i think although if you ask him he might say something different <laughs> <laughs> and how, how are you finding it playing wise um you know are you, are you playing a lot or are you teaching what yeah well i again actually and you feel a little bit kind of self-indulgent because i know um you kind of have to acknowledge that there's an awful lot of suffering has been an awful lot of suffering at this time between you know obviously just people in health and mental health um and just people losing work um but for me personally i had just come out of a very very busy year i just moved to belfast um over a year ago about a year and a half ago and as you know as a freelance musician when you make a move you do have to sort of, you know, maybe play more, do more jobs than, you know, typically if you have a nice balanced life, you do. So I find myself and, you know, I've just bought a house. So I I really needed a break. So lockdown for me came at a really good time. So I must say, um, I actually, in in a funny way, I've been playing more for myself. Um, You know, I'm I'm making plans, I suppose. A bit of a silver lining of, of this time is that, you know, we all need a reset every so often. Um, yeah. It's different, but I personally, I, I love a fresh start. And I've had quite a few of those in my life. Um, I just know things get full and I have to just pull the plug and go, breathe, right, what is it that you're doing? What is it that you want to do? You know, I find myself, I can get a little bit um, muddled or a whole lot muddled. So this has been a lovely, lovely time for me to actually stop Um I find myself after a few days going to the piano at night time thinking, probably like a lot of musicians have done, um, going, going, right, okay, so you've got loads of time now and you can learn new repertoire, blah, 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 blah. And um, again, my kind of default is to go back to, you know, I, I did the whole concert pianist thing years ago. And I think I struggled with the decision of, you know, being able to kind of move myself away from, from the soloist um, role because, you know, I guess if you're trained a certain way, it's your kind of it's your default. Even though I know for me that it doesn't work, it's not where I want to be. Um, but I find myself taking out the music of Rack Three Concerto. I thought, okay, so you can learn this now, <laughs> and as I love it, and it's wonderful. After 15 minutes, I think, why, why are you doing this? <laughs> like it's wonderful music, but you know you're never going to want to get on stage and play this. So maybe just you know, let's have a little real time of what it is that you want to play. Again, um, it was very similar to for for me to was 2014, 2015. 
where I wasn't playing. Um, I took a number of years off of performing, um, solo performing mostly, and I thought I would never play on stage by myself anymore. Um, and I find myself actually going to the piano late at night whenever my son was in bed. Um, he was only a, a wee fella then, uh, and just playing the piano for myself as you know, heavy dippy as that sounds, but just really trying to refine where I wanted to be or what I wanted to play, or if I did want to share it with, you know, people and an audience or not, because I got a little bit kind of really selfish because I had to become selfish about my playing. Um, I had a really intense kind of, you know, the young musician career thing where... Yeah, you know, I, wanted so to ask you, I wanted to ask you about that. So uh, you won the Young Musician of the Year when you were... It, it was 1994, is that right? So how old were you? About 16, just a few years ago. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was the... I won the piano final um, the year that Natalie Klein was the overall winner. Oh, yeah. So I mean, it was an amazing experience. Um, but again, as a youngster, I... I suppose I... It's one of those things, and as a teacher, you see this an awful lot. Just because somebody does something quite well when they're young doesn't mean that, you know, as a person, that they're emotionally developed. Sometimes actually it can be the opposite, because uh, especially for pianists, because you do have to spend so, so much time on your own, in your, in your room. You know, I practiced. I practiced so much better when I was a teenager than I do today. It's a lot more focused, you know. But then suddenly... Um, when I went to London full time at 18 to study at the academy. I, yeah, the first year I kind of kept doing what I was doing, you know, I had an agent and I was playing concerts and I suppose it's the whole buzz of the young musician thing. Um, and I think it works for some people. I think for me, maybe coming from wonderful Derry, um, as you do for the Derry girls, um, I, I, yeah, it was probably the first time that I'd, you know, I'd seen the big world and I was out there on my own and, you know, and I, I found that there was a lot of world that I wanted to see and live and I started questioning everything, which is maybe quite young for questioning things, you know. Oh, no, I think I, I, I'd agree with that. Like, uh, I mean, I, I went to Guildhall School of Music Drama when I was 18 and, um, and again, like, growing up kind of it was very a uh, very musical orientated family you know my my dad was my first teacher and my older sister was already at the academy and you know so it was very much you know this is what's going to happen and i, and I think this is what, what maybe people that aren't involved in the art sector don't realize is you know often especially with musicians i think you know if you show any sort of promise at an early age you can be sort of pushed in this sort of direction and and you're not uh, mature enough really emotionally to deal with that and that, it, that is a problem isn't it I, I think a lot of people then struggle in their 20s um to come to terms with that sort of pressure early on very much so very very much so i mean I, again you can sort of understand it um i mean i have a great relationship with with my mom my mom's a piano teacher and you know she taught me from a very young age and then when I was nine, I got a scholarship to go down to Dublin to the, the academy there. So every Saturday, got the bus. And in those days, you know, the, the roads were rocky. So it was a good four and a half hours bus journey for my theory lesson, for my 45 minute theory lesson with lovely Marie Morin, and then my two hour piano lesson. Um, I think I always had a, a bit of time for some clothes shopping afterwards. And then back on the bus at five or six, back home at 10 o'clock. So, you know, that, that was what I did for yeah, nine years, nine till I was 18. Um, and as much as I understand that, you know, there is, of course, there's a certain amount of training and all that stuff and the focus. And I mean, I, I didn't question it. It wasn't that, because a lot of people say, you know, were you, were you forced? And I was like, no. But what I did feel whenever then I stopped and, you know, life got a bit messy. I was a little bit messy and I was a little bit broken. And, you know, I've had years and years of therapy to try and work my way back to just being a, being a human being, I suppose, which I felt I became quite robotic in what I was doing. And as much as to the outside world, I seemed to be having this great old time and career and I was a bit of a party girl, you know, but you know, that was definitely a reflection of what was going on inside of me. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, the emotional maturity that comes with just, I suppose, just living life. Mm. Um, in a normal not being locked away in, in a practice or not locking yourself away in a practice room you know but um that, I guess that's just the, the journey you know I feel I feel I feel grateful that I have been able to sort of 
pull myself back from that into um, a way of that. That was the whole thing. Whenever I brought myself back to deciding that I did want to play the piano again, because I did. I had a few years where, um, firstly, that I was in a, a an abusive relationship for a number of years, um, very controlling, and uh, playing the piano or performing wasn't really something that was encouraged. Um, by my then partner a long time ago. Uh, and I suppose because I was already struggling with it as well, it, it just seemed to happen, you know. Um, but whenever I left um, that relationship in London, um, 2004, uh, on Christmas Day, packed my bags on Christmas Day, and uh, yeah, decided back to Derry, back home, which I didn't know, I didn't know that I could have gone there all along. This is the thing that people don't understand whenever they're in situations that are very unhealthy, um, to put it very lightly. Um, and there I thought, right, okay. So I would have been 27, 28, hadn't been playing. Yeah, I hadn't been really playing for a few years. Um, and then decide, okay, you're gonna go back to what you know. And what I knew was, you know, eight hours a day you know, practice. Um, I decided that I would do some international piano competitions because, not because I wanted to, um, again, human beings were very silly, but I just, I didn't want to have any regrets. And people always said that that's what you had to do to have a career here as a, you know, as a concert pianist. It was too, too, uh, too old at that stage anyway, especially as a, as a solo pianist, you know, you're sort of, you do your thing when you're younger. Um, I think it is, a, it is an issue as well, isn't it, with, um, with the music business again. But there's, I definitely ha have that feeling as well, but there's all the path that you should be taking like you know I still have it even though I live in rural Ireland I'm incredibly happy with my family I'm, I'm incredibly happy you know running my chamber music ensemble and everything but I still look at like the orchestral jobs coming up all around the world going oh god I should really go for that I should really go for and it's like but I left all that you know I, I did that bit and you know it wasn't for me it wasn't you know what what I needed you know in my life um for whatever reason at that time but it, it's it's funny that sort of ingrained sort of feeling of oh I should be doing that but like there, there should be this sort of this is how you have a musical career <laughs> and it, it's difficult to branch out and, and trust yourself isn't it to to make the right decisions that, that that word should is so dangerous it's one that i try to bin but you know we're learning all the time but yeah i should do this I, i'm totally you know I, i'm learning more and more about myself over the years and i'm 43 and i'm still thinking okay i'm just learning i'm just beginning to understand how to try and be a human being but um i am totally you know self-abuse was a massive part of, of my life you know and even in, in therapy learning that actually for years how i treated my relationship with the piano almost could be seen as a bit of a like self-abuse thing because it was you know, a constant guilt constant guilt of not practicing you know i remember having teachers when you know i was younger and said you know if you have a, a day in which you don't practice that's a day that you can never regain and i was like wow okay that's so and i take things very literally so i had to work very hard to be able to just stop and let that stuff go and then and I, again it's very hippy dippy but I, I learned that i was actually just a wee girl who loved playing the piano who just loved being there and connecting um maybe because i find you know i'm definitely an introvert and again i'm sure you you, you may agree with this or, or or not but you know the world the artists world world musicians it is kind of geared towards or just the world in general it's geared towards extroverts yeah we're becoming more um aware more accepting that you know everybody's totally different you know so i do well on my own um and I ha had to find my own way of doing it. And I had to let go of being concerned about the judgment of other people, you know, especially the people in the music business, because we're all, we're all trained. So this is what you do. Um, so I decided in 2016, whenever I released uh, my little debut album um, called Reconnection, again, very heavy dippy and a little bit cheesy, but that's what it meant for me. Um, I really had just sat at the piano at night time when my son was asleep and played and just learned what I felt really good in playing. And I had a little moment where I thought, actually it might be nice because I did hide, I hid away for years. Curtains were closed, you know, I suffer with mental health issues. I, I still struggle. Um, and again, I don't think when you are somebody that has had experience of mental health issues that it goes away completely. 
you just learn how to deal and you learn to be more aware of whenever it starts to happen you know um, can i ask you uh, with the mental health like how how you know you talk about self-care and and i mean i've i've struggled um with my mental health over the years as well and and i do think it's important but it is talked about and, and especially in the artistic world and especially right now when things are quite tough for a lot of people you know um but, but we're probably going to see quite a lot of people struggling you know for various reasons you know and and maybe it's helpful just to see you know what what things have you found um for self-care that have really worked for you but maybe i can try if someone else might like to try well, again i think it's it's a very personal thing and also what i've learned is that kind of in different seasons you need you do need different things is it um uh, is it Robin Sharma his name is he's a American motivational speaker but he has a nice kind of spiritual element to him but listening to him speak about that sort of you know spring and summer and sometimes you need to be like full on and motivated and sometimes that's the thing that's good for your self-care and then at other times it's the switch off it's the meditation it's the quiet you know because again I, I went into recovery from addiction in 2010 and that really was my light bulb moment of like oh right, <laughs> the sky is blue and I can breathe. And these feelings that I'm feeling are really, really overwhelming. So I had to really restart as, as a person. And it was, good. it was nothing to do with the piano. Uh, it was just me being, you know, trying to was learning to be myself and learning to actually, well, one step at a time, not love myself, but actually like myself mm -hmm. initially. So obviously a massive part of that was slowing down um meditation which is very very difficult for people uh, especially initially because we're used to you know the brain going you know 100 miles a minute um and i think a lot of people when they start meditation me included you you think oh it's about not thinking oh you know i'm feeling at this meditation thing because my brain's still still going but actually the key to meditation is accepting that there's lots and lots of thoughts coming and going but you're just not getting caught up in them you're trying to just be there in the noise but you know just being centered N not that i'm any 100 percent proof <laughs> i have moments where i'm really good with self-care i get up uh, at the moment i'm being very good with things so i get up and i do my exercise um and then i'll sit and i'll always read some sort of spiritual books or you know self-care books and do a little bit of meditation and for me if i can do that that really sets me up for the day um i even I've, uh, during this time as well i think i'd message you this morning um sometimes i actually use playing the piano as a way to really grind myself in the morning so i'll come in i find like the darkness <laughs> i always pull the curtains and light a candle i find that very soothing for me um so just nice and quiet and just playing a little bit of kind of very simple piano that i love to play i'm not talking about heavy you know Rachmaninoff for a ship on ages you know just nice simple stuff that just makes me feel connected to myself no, speak, speaking of connection because you, you mentioned your album there reconnection which i was listening to last night actually and and i love the, the mixture of styles you have and and you play so beautifully you can really you can really feel you know what it means to you playing that now, you know you're you're a wonderful pianist and musician it's it's a delight to listen to but i'm just wondering um you know you said you had a long break from playing like did you not play at all in that time or was it just not playing in the public i trying to think so i was pregnant with my son when i was about 23 um i remember actually doing some concerts when i was pregnant which was all so much fun but really at that stage i i start and i know a lot of people a lot of women when they then they, they have children things are a lot less but it was there was a lot more to me not playing than just that i did go back um, actually to the Royal College in London. I did my postgrad um, for one year, but everything just started not working for me then. Even my, my performing, uh, maybe everybody's the same. I'm not sure for me. I, I have to be well in myself to be able to play, mm. which just, just shows you it's such a, such a connection to how you are and who we are as a person. I'm not somebody that can sit at the piano and play if I'm not feeling well. I'm just like, I'm out. So obviously I was not in a good place in those days, you know, abusive relationship, um, mentally just very, very 
broken, I suppose, in a way. Um, so that was, yeah, I suppose I stopped completely playing for maybe four or five years. Yeah. Um, come back to, to Derry. As I said, I, tr I tried the solo concert thing again for maybe two years out of just pure stubbornness of like, right, this is what I do. And again, it was really sad actually because what had been working for me or what I thought had been working for me in my life just wasn't working anymore. So I had to put my hands up um, and stop and just completely stop. You know, I was actually quite an upsetting time. So I was 27, 28, around that time. I was a single mom. My little mom was there. I was also very used to being self-indulgent, having all the time to practice, you know, when you were younger and suddenly, not about you anymore. And, you know, that was motherhood. And I, I struggled with that um, as a person. You know, it's like, oh my God, like how do I deal with that? So not the right thing to do possibly, but I just decided I'm just not going to do this, you know. So what, we, what did you do um, instead? Were you, did you just concentrate on being a mum or? I, well, I was teaching, I had some students for the first time. I did do some, um, some accompanying. I also decided, to, right, so what do, pian what do pianists do if they don't do the solo thing or they don't have, you know, regular people that they're collaborating with? Because Derry, as lovely as it is, and it's my hometown, there's not an awful lot of musicians living there. Um, so I did, I, I did some opera work for a few years, did some rep work, um, which was a great way of going out and playing, but without, you know, the sort of that, that pressure that I felt that I, I found hard to deal with. Um, did that for a few years. And then really what was the turning point for me coming back into playing a little bit, you know, and I'm still, I, I, I think I'll always struggle with stage, stage fright, not, probably not stage fright anymore. But I did struggle with that when I came back to playing in 2013. So 2013, Derry became um, the city of culture. So it was definitely a moment. I remember thinking, God, if I can't get out and play, you know, a few times this year, that. Yeah, that's not great. So I remember just having little conversations with myself and I was asked to do a few things. So that was definitely a point in which I decided I needed to look at why, you know, why I wasn't, was it that now that I was choosing not to play because I just didn't want to play? Or was it the fear, the big old fear that I was actually allowing myself to listen to? Um, I think for me personally, I think I needed the break. I don't think it was just about fear, but then when you take a few years off performing, it's very hard to get back up there. Yeah. Very, very. Uh, I remember my, my teacher, John O'Connor, saying that it's easier to do 100 concerts a year than just one. And I was just doing a few performances. So every time I had to play, and I'm not talking about like full concerts, just a piece or two. It just took everything out of me, you know, and sometimes it felt awful. Mm. You know, I've tried, I've tried everything. Um, I've tried hypnotherapy, which it was really helpful um, for me just getting used to, to breathing, um, visualization, uh, and very much just a mindset of being able to get to get back up. Uh, as funny as it sounds, you know, I, I did have to kind of, how I got myself back into playing on stage by myself was, I had to think, worst case scenario. So what's the worst case scenario? So you go out there on stage, you start making things up in your head, you go out there on stage and you just can't you just can't play so you just get up <laughs> and you go home and everybody will talk about you for the night tomorrow will be fine like everybody you know that was that was i know that's a little bit extreme it's very uh, it's very typical me but uh, I no no I, I i can completely understand that because i've 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 suffered from quite bad anxiety over the years and, and i had like a middle sort of period of about 15 years where i was fine i didn't really get anything but um yeah even actually uh, a couple of years ago now when i was pregnant with my little one i i started having massive anxiety attacks and it, and it was linked to anxiety due you know with the pregnancy and everything but but i think because when we're performing we're giving so much of our personal self mm -hmm. you know it becomes entwined and it's it's like it's really difficult to separate the two and just go oh i'm i'm at work i'm going to perform and you, know, you can't do that because your work is actually expressing who you are and I, and I i found i had to work really really hard for that year to like you say just to find ways of grounding myself before i i went on to perform and and the breathing became so such a big you know i mean i found yoga really really helped me sort of physically and 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 you know 
um, emotionally to, to get through. But, but I, I, I do think it's important to talk about anxiety within performance because there are an awful lot of people I know that suffer from it. And sometimes it can just be the small bow shake, you know, um, which most people wouldn't even notice. But, you know, I, I do know people that are, you know, pretty much uh, paralyzed with fear before going on, you know, and, and big names as well suffer from it I and mean, it's not really something that's talked about a lot because I suppose it seems weak you know and always but uh, you know we all we're all human we all have those moments of vulnerability and it's important to be able to talk about it I think and I am such a big advocate for being open and and honest about my, my ongoing battle with with mental health you know so much better than it that it was a few years ago but i do you know i i do get some criticism from people around me um and you know not, not that it matters of you know why do you have to like tell everything why do you have to i'm going for years i wasn't honest and it wasn't that i was i wasn't honest with myself because i didn't know what was going on um and then as you, when you're in that type of relationship it's all about secrecy um the power that i learned as a person and again not a, as just as a musician, although it's the same thing, um, of putting my hands up, of picking up the phone, of asking for help. I, mean, I, I was actually amazed. There was something that was really, really wonderful about being in Derry. Um, you know, I moved from London to Derry, so it was a big shock to the system, so many levels. But you know, Derry people are wonderful, and you know, in a wee way, I'm, I'm lucky. The kind of Derry are very proud of people that have gone on and done something. You know, so they, they call me the wee Derry girl that plays the piano, but. Um, actually just being brave to enough to go you know life is not perfect i am not that big international piano, piano player that i had thought that i was going to be at this time this is where i'm at in my life and i need help you know um women's aid were amazing i wouldn't have had the well i didn't have because i was a shell of a person whenever i, I came home from london number one having the guts to go this is not right you know this person is still harassing me for years after even though I've left um I'm just for somebody to look at you go we are going to make sure that you're okay you know and then again because I'd started therapy and I started feeling um and then the feelings were just I didn't know what to do with these feelings so then you know addiction becomes part of that because that's what addiction is just people hurting and not being able to deal with themselves um so again being able to get help and going to to rehab and you know and I, I just still I'm a massive fan of just say it if you're not okay just but I, I know as much as we're getting better at talking about it it's it is still a massive like oh well yeah. she's you know can, can I, I ask can I ask him and it's a personal question I know but you know you talk about being in an abusive relationship um what was the catalyst for you actually leaving because I know that that is the hardest step is actually that step to leave that house leave that yeah well there was a certain thing and I really can't really don't want to maybe share no, too no, much no. that's fine yeah of, of course but um obviously I didn't like myself an awful lot in those days because that's you know, that's what you are that's why you allow these things to happen um but when it starts affecting other people around you I always made a promise if that happens I am out so that happened and that was my always my promise to myself so yeah and it, it, it was enough and I didn't do it for me that was the thing that's years then of building myself back um, to like wow you can't you can't let people be like that with you it's like beyond words as I'm, I'm sure you understand you know and it makes well I'm 43 now and I just I can't if I'm not happy and you know it's a wee bit self-indulgent maybe but if I'm not happy not that you have to be happy all the time, being content or peaceful at least, then I just don't want, I don't want to be in it, whether that be a work thing or a life thing, you know, so it's, it's, I suppose it's given me quite a maybe low tolerance, um, but definitely, I'm definitely more boundary about myself because I am quite a, I'm quite a softy and again, maybe it's a musician thing, I, I feel a lot, a lot of feelings, um, and sometimes that's very overwhelming, that's where you know, mental health stuff still gets, where I learn, right, you just have to stop right now. I've even found in the last few weeks with, you know, so much going on in the world, um, and as much as you, you can't be blind to it, you know, you can't totally, and you know, I don't listen to the news and stuff like that, because I think you, know, you will always hear things when you have to hear them, but you do have to, you have to be aware and you have to try and 
you know, well, not to be totally just in your own little bubble, but I have created my own little bubble for myself and that feels safe. And, and I think that that's okay as well because everybody, everybody works differently, don't they? Oh, absolutely. And I know it's, it's a problem I have um, when you say about, you know, watching the news and stuff over the years, like I get so so emotionally involved in a story that it kind of um it's like almost my old traumas come back in and you're like well, that's not what it's about you've got to sort of separate them and you know and, and that can be hard and, and like you say you know I'm, I'm 43 as well it's the same sort of age you know I think we were both we were both in our young 20s going through you know quite quite sort of tough relationships uh, and it does it takes a lifetime to sort of move on from that and it definitely affects how you um, react with other situations and other people and and maybe sometimes that's misunderstood um, but I, I think you're right you know it's, it's learning to be true to yourself and 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 how you need to be to survive <laughs> Absolutely. and that's 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 to do with our music as well our music making you know I I very much try and do my own thing and this like, lockdown has given me a little chance to try and be brave and break myself out of you know, doing what maybe in the last year I've been doing lots of playing and lots of, of you know, musical drugs. But I've always had a thing about trying to write some music for myself, you know, and, and I'm a massive fan of, you know, minimalist Max Richter, Oliver Arnold's, that sort of music, which is just beautiful. And again, I find it very uh, meditative, um, very grounding. So I could be absolutely. I can't say the word I want to say. Add it to enjoying just going, right, okay, just be brave and just be a beginner. Again, I've actually been taking some, all, I'm taking some online lessons with, with a guy in London, um, but composition uh, just and harmony and stuff like that, which right. I just, I love being a beginner and, and relearning, you know, so as much as, I don't know if, if you're doing any, are you doing any teaching at the moment? I am seeing students online, um, but I love I love being at the other side of that as well. Um, I have a few projects lined up, um, and lovely Neil Martin, who I've done some collaborating with prior to to lockdown. Um, we've been chatting about putting some programs together and hopefully getting that out and about. But you know, whenever that happens, that's the thing. Uh, initially in lockdown, I think we all did that sort of right must do some playing online, which is you know lovely in one sense of you know you can still sort of share a little bit um but then i think i think you have to be very careful of that that you know we do have to still put a put a price on ourselves on our time on our sharing um you know artists shouldn't just share themselves for free and uh as much as yes it's part of the healing and all that stuff for you know if i, I just think if it feels right then you should do it, but you shouldn't feel under any pressure to do it at all. Uh, I think I find myself in the first few weeks of lockdown getting a little overwhelmed with, like you mentioned before, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. And then I had to stop and go, right, sit down, sit down, quiet. <laughs> if something feels good, if you feel like going and playing and doing a little video, then do it. And if you don't, that's also fine, you know. But exactly. um, yeah. Whenever we're going to get out to, back into the concert hall, who who knows? You know, and that's the thing, isn't it? You can't really because we don't know when. If we knew, right, it's going to be another few months. As much as that is a lot, we could still plan ahead, or you know. But it's it's the unknown. Yeah. And it's this whole place that everybody seems to be well, not everybody, but there's quite a push to get back out to the normal stuff, which well, I'm not going to get into. <laughs> <laughs> of COVID and I don't know anything about these things but yeah it is a little bit concerning I think if everybody could just be quiet for a moment <laughs> we might get out there then full time a little bit earlier <laughs> no, exactly I mean ho hopefully we'll all be back in the concert hall soon I, I know certainly we're all hoping and but that happens um but Ruth, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, you know, thank you for being so open with everything. It um, means a lot. And I hope we get to play together soon, um, wherever that is. Absolutely. We'll make sure of it, for sure. <laughs> okay, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you so much. Bye.